everybody. Uh, I'm Robert Kovacic with the lofty title of president of the Los Angeles Press Club. And on behalf of SPJ and the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasting Association, we want to welcome you here tonight. Those of us in the business had the privilege of working with and a man that we are here to honor. And we want to, first of all, welcome members of the Chamber's family. We want to welcome the Honorable Richard Reardon, who is also um, one of the advisory board members for the Los Angeles Press Club. And we thank you for being here tonight, Mayor Reardon, as well as Councilman Tom LaBonge, who will be joining us, and uh, the former president of the Los Angeles Press Club, uh, Bill Rosendahl, and former city councilman, cannot be here tonight, but he sends his regards and with the utmost respect for Stan Chambers. And with that said, let's begin with remembering a little bit about Stan. The dashing young man on the sleigh is Stan Chambers, circa 1952. The show is Frosty Frolics, the only TV show on ice. Stan Chambers got a job at KTLA in 1947, a few months after the station signed on the air. And put simply, he stayed. Here he is in the Soviet Union in 1959, demonstrating American technology to the Russians in the form of a Polaroid cat. Anyone who has worked at Channel 5 for two generations has worked with or for Stan Chambers. He was my news director at one point. He was a fellow reporter at another point. Uh, he is one of those rare people in any television station who survives all of the turmoil and all of the turnovers. I think it's probably because he's a loyal person and uh, he's a dedicated human being. He's a good man. A really nice guy. Everybody says that about him. And uh, frankly, I've gotten tired of hearing it over the years. Uh, but I believe it. And it is astonishing that such a nice man, decent man, good news man, could last so long. You can't tell the story of television news in this community from the very beginnings to today without having chambers run through it from the start right up to now. He has been the glue that has held KTLA together. He stepped in and ran the news department when there was no, quote, news director. He stepped out gracefully when they got a news director. He anchored the news when they didn't have an anchor man, quote, and he stepped out when they got an anchor man. He's an all-purpose journalist, and uh, he is, I believe, probably the dean in this town. Thank you very much. So here's to Stan Chambers in his 35th year at KTLA. I confess that years ago, uh, decades ago, uh, thanks to Craig Hume, who's in the audience somewhere, I worked at KTLA. And I had this ridiculous honor uh, in my childhood to work alongside Hal Fishman and Jerry Rubin and Roger Scott and Stan Chambers. And I think back on it. And the one thing that Stan told me was, just tell them what you see. The anchor of KTLA and our newest board member here at the Los Angeles Press Club, someone we all know and love. And she is coming up to the podium right now, the one and only Cher Kelp. The reason why I'm here at the Press Club, and you know, if it's only been a month, um, since I was, it was announced on Twitter, and I didn't know that I was elected to the board of directors, that I was so surprised and so excited about it. Um, because as a journalist, it's something that you want to be part of, and where you can do something like this um, as my, my first project is really an honor. Uh, to see so many of the chambers here, thank you so much. Some of you have come from San Diego. Um, some from Hancock Park. I know it's difficult, <laughs> but thank you so much. And for all of his friends and colleagues, uh, this is really special because we all love Stan. And and I've worked. I've now worked at KTLA for ten years, and I've had the pleasure of working with both Stan and Jamie Chambers. And so I've seen. I feel like a, a part of your family because. Um, something that I told uh, Jamie and some of your family members as well is that when I first walked into KTLA, uh, Stan said something to me that was very sweet and he said, welcome to the family, to the KTLA family. And that struck me because it's 
not something you would expect to hear when you're walking into a station, especially after the station I was just at. So <laughs> um, I was like, oh, okay. And um, a couple of days after his uh, um, funeral, I was home and I was looking for something and I came across News at 10. Um, the, with the book that your father wrote, that your grandfather wrote. And I know that when he gave it to me, when someone gives me a book that they write, I ask them to sign it. And when I was looking for something, I, saw, I said, oh my gosh, look at this. And I said, I, I wonder if he signed it. And when I opened it up, it said, Cher, we're very fortunate to have you. You're gonna love it here. And he's right but I feel very fortunate because now I've met all of you. And so everybody, please welcome my boss, my friend as well, the news director of KTLA, Jason Ball. When I think of Stan, I, I think of him as a light. I, whenever he would walk into the newsroom, he would just illuminate the place. Whoever he was talking to, there was a joy and a lightness that, that came with it. He was one of the first people to welcome me to KTLA, and the smile in those bright blue eyes put me immediately at ease, and I, I felt at home and part of the family. Uh, not long after I got there, Stan and I visited the Ronald McDonald House, where I will never forget, he was talking to the families of these, you know, these sick young patients and their families, and there was no pity, no sadness, nothing. He was talking to them like they were his long lost best friends. And that's just who he was. That's how he was with everyone. And it was, it was such a gift and it was such a great thing for me to be able to, to witness. Um, <laughs> you know, even in the last days of his career, Stan was still enterprising stories. He would figure out what story he wanted to do. He would set it up. He would do the interviews. He would log his video, whether it was, you know, <laughs> he went from film to videotape to digital. So he had seen it all and, and rolled with all of that and write the script. And then he would sit on the set and he would present this story about a program for underprivileged youth like it was the most important story of the day. It was like it was the lead story. And he had the excitement and the exuberance of a cub reporter, but he also had that dignity and that grace of the wise sage that he was. You know, Stan was the dean. It was in, in the video they said that. He, not just because he filed thousands of stories and he had an unprecedented career that lasted over 63 years. He was the dean because he led us all by example. He it was the, the, the example for us to have. In the business where so many people get frustrated and stressed out and even jaded, Stan always remembered and in turn reminded us what a blessing it really is to be able to do what we do. So when Stan retired, I took the frame publicity photo and I put it in my window in my office. So he's always there with me. So I could always remember that light, that light and even though he's not with us anymore, I want to carry that light with me for the rest of my career. And I hope, I know many of you, you will too. Now, <laughs> I have the distinct pleasure of introducing another Los Angeles icon, the Honorable Richard Reardon, who was the mayor of Los Angeles from 1993 to 2001. In addition to a political career, Mr. Reardon is a successful businessman and philanthropist. Thank you very much. I don't know what more can be said about Stan. He was the nicest person I've ever met in Los Angeles or any place else. He was humble, but he was tenacious. And the one thing I learned today is he has 38 grandchildren. Well, my mother had 36, and I thought she had set a record, but I, and, uh, and his daughter Mary is here, and my venture capital firm invested in her businesses, and we made a fortune, and Stan made a fortune in it. So I own, owe, owe an awful lot to the Chambers family. Without further ado, they call him Mr. Hollywood. And uh, yeah, you know who you are. Everybody knows who you are. Every time you see him, he lights up a room. Council member, we're gonna miss you. 
Tom LaVange. First of all, it's just great to see the Chambers family. What a remarkable family it is. Uh, your dad, your grandfather, your great-grandfather was the richest man in Los Angeles. To be at St. Brendan's on the night before the funeral, half the church was filled, and it was all family. And there were some parishioners who came in the back out of respect. And nobody liked the Chambers family. And it truly is deep. And then you talk to that issue, those in the city who got to meet him and how special he was. I want to thank Mayor Reardon for the opportunity that he gave me for seven years uh, in working for him. And, and I remember how Stan was out there when you were inspecting all those uh, mobile homes up by Silmar after the 94 quake. And Stan was communicating to the public on what to do, how to be safe. But then I went back in my mind, and I remember as a child, all of them, and then talk about Roscoe Meyer Road and the fire at Bel Air in 61. And, and then I remember the Baldwin Hills Saturday afternoon. My brother went to St. John Vianney, and they were playing baseball out at uh, Jackie Robinson Stadium, which was near Dorsey High School. And there was a big flood, and there was Stan. And then I remember 1963, I was selling newspapers on Hyperion Avenue. And uh, there was no Rampart Division then, and all the police cars came racing up from Central Division up Griffith Park. And all the police cars came racing up Hyperion from Hollywood. And then I saw the telemobile, and I knew Stan Chambers was there, and I ran all the way up to Surrey Street, Pete Demetrio, where the shootout was that three officers did die, but they were shot, and a young commander named Daryl Gates thought of SWAT off of Surrey Street. But Stan Chambers was there. And he was everywhere for Los Angeles, which was so important. Recently, before he retired, we got to go someplace where he had never been. And I couldn't believe it, you know. I couldn't believe whether Hewell Hauser or Stan Chambers hadn't been anywhere in this state, you know. <laughs> but it was the Bronson Caves, and the Bronson Caves is in the old where the Batman mobile came out. Stan had never been there. We did a story, and it was such an honor to be with him. I remember the night of the tragic Pan Pacific fire. And uh, Stan Chambers was there, and he told me that was his first assignment that Kloss gave him, to go down Van Ness Avenue and come to the ice capades or whatever was at the old Pan Pacific. And then further, uh, he was there when it was tragically destroyed. Stan was everywhere. How many buildings did he dedicate and see demolished in this town? Without further ado, you know? he was former there. He news was director of KTLA, a good friend of Stan, who worked with him so many years, Jeff Wald. You know, I didn't prepare any notes or anything like that because I want to tell you a little bit about the kind of person Sam was. We all know he was a nice guy and all that stuff. But I'll tell you, as a news director, he was a dream because he could do a story about anything at any time at the flip of a, of a hat. All you had to do was ask him to go out and do it. He never refused an assignment. You asked, I felt terrible asking him to go up in the helicopter, you know, because he was one of the senior members of the staff. But he would jump for joy to do any story that he felt was important and, and to the community. And that was what was just so amazing about him. Um, a loving man. Uh, I still can't figure out how he worked all the hours that he worked at our station and long hours and how he wound up with 11 children. I can't figure it out. That I would like to introduce uh, a person who I hired uh, to carry on Stan's uh, legacy at KTLA and that's Jamie Chambers. His grandson. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate that. I actually brought notes. And by the way, I still have that brush jacket. I, I wear that brush jacket when I can't find mine. Absolutely. It says, it says Stan on the, on the side. But, but Stan was a really different kind of grandfather. He, uh, he was my mentor. He was my colleague. He was my teacher. But most importantly, he, he felt like mine. He felt like my grandfather. There's so many of us grandkids that it's hard to get a little time with him. So it was really exciting when I got to go out there for the first time. He wasn't the grandfather that took you fishing. He never took me to Disneyland. I never got to sit on his shoulders. But he would take me to different places. He took me to forest fires <laughs> and <laughs> bomb threats and plane crashes and SWAT standoffs, but he always made sure that I got to wear a bulletproof vest when we had an extra one. And, uh, and when I started working at KTLA all those years ago, um, Jeff will remember this, certainly. I started, I asked Dan, well, what, what do I wear at the station? Uh, you know, I'm just hustling around. We said, of course, you're gonna wear a suit. And when it gets really hot, you can even take the jacket off. Um, it's just been an honor and a privilege to, to 
have that really unique moment of 10 years with my grandfather, the Dean of Los Angeles, getting to study under his tutelage and getting to experience life in such a, a unique way through those fires, through those floods. We had countless adventures. Um, I'm the luckiest grandkid on the planet, I know. Um, and I'm just gonna miss him so much. I'm gonna miss him for the, the wins that he would celebrate with us and the losses that he would commiserate with us. But mostly, I'm just gonna miss hugging him. The guy was amazing, he was a great hugger. So thank you guys so much for listening. Someone else in attendance who is one of the larger than life personalities that you will ever meet. And he sets a very high bar in the field. When you're out there on stories with him, you know that you better bring your A game. And he has a few things to say, and it's really our pleasure to have him. Uh, Pete Demetrio of KFWB is joining us right now. I never, uh, I never worked with Stan at KTLA. I was not part of that family. The family, I was an extended cousin for Stan, if you want to call it that, I was out in the field from 1978 until the day Stan, Stan never left the field. I don't think he ever retired, ever. But in a transitory world of information passing that seems to move faster and faster every second, where urgency is the norm and standards erode in its face and there are fewer and fewer reference points where you can look to something or someone with confidence and say, follow that example. Start from here, expand outward using your skills to tell the story. There was such an example, there was such a man that was Stan Chambers. And I was privileged to, to watch him as a member of the audience growing up. And then there is no finer appellation, no finer tribute that can be given to a person who in our world in which truth is malleable or spun, stood for truth, stood for the story. Stan Chambers, journalist. That's the man I do. He spent a lot of time with Stan on the field, and so he might have better stories for you than I ever would, and that is John Fisher. I got to work eight hours a day, five days a week, for almost 12 years in a news van with Stan, sitting side by side as his cameraman. I got to see him in good times and bad times, and you name it, I saw it. Heck, I got to spend more time with him than most of his family. Uh, I certainly had more dinners. I learned so much from him by observation. I got to see him every day. I got to see him in action. I got to see the way he treated people. And that's what was really special. Everybody would walk up to Stan. And then sometimes they'd call him Hal. <laughs> but he'd always go, oh gosh, it's so nice to meet you. And so, he never corrected them. He never lost that outwardly wonderful humanness that he had uh, to people. He was a remarkable man. And I have so many stories you wouldn't believe. I've got 12 years of them, five days a week. Uh, you know, I, I miss him so much, and I learned so much, and he is so dear to me. And I hope to emulate him as closely as I can in so many ways, and I fail daily, but he is just a very special person. Someone um, that has worked uh, with Stan for many, many years and um, was very excited about being here today and to the fact that she had the day off to come over um, and, and be part of this because she was so close to him. And we've heard from um, his photographer, from his uh, news directors, from his grandson, from his colleagues, um, and now to hear from one of his writers, Diana Chi. I'm so glad that the press club gave me this opportunity to speak about Stan and my personal story about him. One time when I was driving to St. Brendan's, I saw Stan that was after Beth's passing. 
And I saw Stan walking briskly, but there was a sadness on his face, and I knew he missed Bev. They used to go to morning mass every day in Holy Communion before Stan went to work. Then a couple of years later, Stan remarried Gigi, and I saw a big difference on, him, on his face. His face lit up, he was happy again. I just want to thank you for listening and um, thank the Stan Chambers family for their support. And may God keep Stan in the palm of his hand. And may Stan rest in peace. Amen. Uh, right now, I'd like to bring up my friend, a friend of Stan's, a uh, reporter in town for many years, George McQuaid. George. Stan Chambers and I met at a Daryl Gates news conference. Very boring, but at a very exciting time. It was right after KTLA had aired the Rodney King beating. They were the only ones that aired that, and Police Chief Daryl Gates waited five days. He was in New York, and then he came out. But I met Stan Chambers at the news conference, very nice guy. He was known as a gentleman then, and he's known as a gentleman even up to his last day. But what was interesting is I met him later at the LA riots. <laughs> Florence and Normandy is the flashpoint. I wasn't stupid, I was like Pete Demetrio. I went up a couple of blocks and I walked down because I didn't want to get killed. I was the only white guy for miles in South Central. But Stan Chambers was the kind of guy, when I ran into him at one of the sites, it was a burning mall. I can't even remember the mall because I'd never been to South Central. All I remember is broken glass burning and then the fire truck. That was the scene. But when Stan Chambers and I met at one of the burning malls and he was doing a live shot, after his live shot, this is a guy that looked like he was going to lunch. He was always calm. And I was so hyper, I hadn't even been to South Central, uh, Central LA. And I went up to him and I, and I said, so, so what's going on? And he would take the time to explain to you where you are, what the mall is, and what was happening, even as the people were running towards us to kill us. Dan was the kind of guy that would stay up all night to finish the story. He never left a story. He always stayed forever and ever. And to you, you were the greatest. Thanks. Without further ado, we now have Ed Chambers, number 10 of the 11 of the Chambers clan. Wow, this has been a truly amazing night. Um, I know I speak on behalf of all my brothers and sisters and, and Gigi and the grandkids when I say that um, listening to your words, um, hearing your sentiments, um, the way that you express your love for Stan has meant a great deal to all of us, and we will remember this night forever. <laughs> growing up in our house, it was sort of like growing up in this big bubble. As kids, we were all inside this world. We were protected. It wasn't a wild world. It wasn't a, an exciting world. It was just a quiet place where we could grow and where we were always protected. And when I look back on that world, I know that it was that bubble because of dad. When I look out at all of you, and I appreciate that we were his didn't kids. Didn't micromanage us. You were his we kids. Grew we grew up all his um, in his presence. Just his presence was enough to tell us what we needed to do. And for the next 20, 25 years, whatever it is that we may have, it's up to us to continue to live and to keep the presence of our dad, of all of our dad inside us, and to share him with each other. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm not feeling very well. So
So Diane's going to come up and share some uh, thought, uh, some words from, from Gigi. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to say that Gigi feels very badly that she couldn't be here tonight. She's, um, she's having some difficulty handling everything. So um, I told her I was coming. She asked me to please convey that to all of you, that um, she cares very much for everyone who worked with Stan and all of his family means very much to her. Um, she sends her love. One day, somebody didn't show up, and Stephanie sent me out to cover story. And I, um, I was terrified. I was out of my depth, and I was very frightened. And um, there was a press conference going on. It was a, a, a murder that had happened. And I didn't know what I was supposed to be telling the, the camera crew what B-roll to shoot and all this stuff. And they weren't really listening to me. And um, so I, uh, I was just kind of asking around. And all the uh, reporters were kind of elbowing their way to the front. And then there was this, this tall man with these very beautiful blue eyes who was standing there very calmly and very quietly and noticed my distress. And he said, you just come and stand right here, dear. You can hear him saying that, right? And I said, now don't worry, you haven't missed very much. I'll, I'll tell you what, what's gone on. And he basically gave me the story. Which I, which I then, which I then, you know, uh, did. And um, a few weeks later, or maybe a few months later, St uh, Stephanie said, "You know, I've got an, another story. Uh, so and so is called in sick today, and you can go out and cover this." And I said, "Is Stan Chambers going to be there?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know, Jeff. If you might remember, it was about five years ago, and Stan was sitting uh, in the in the den watching this fire and he was just <laughs> he was like this in the chair and I said Stan you should be covering that and he said I certainly should I certainly should and so I got on the phone and I called Jeff Wall do you remember that and I said you know I think Stan would really love to cover this fire and you said send him on out tell him to get his get his clothes on and come right on down to the station and I just love you for that I really will always love you for that because that meant the world to him, and um, to his dying day, that's that was who he was. That's all he lived for. That's all he thought about, and really, he was always asking Gigi, you know, why can't I go to the station? He always wanted to go to the station, and it's just it was it was who he was. It was it defined him, and it was um, such a tremendous love for him. Um, in the end, um, I have to say that um, he retained those magnificent, beautiful blue eyes that to me were like the eyes of a child in that they always held so much curiosity and uh, anticipation, excitement, enthusiasm. He never lost that. His eyes never got dull. Um, it was amazing. And I, I had the privilege and the honor of being included with the rest of the Chambers family the last few days of Stan's life. And those eyes were still there looking up at everyone with so much love and so much joy. And uh, the last thing I want to say is he was professional all the way, all the way. When I went to J school at USC, we were always taught, you know, that news isn't, it's not about you. You, you know, your job is to prevent, present <laughs> the facts objectively. And Stan always did that. And I have to say, I never knew. I assumed that he was a Republican because he lived such, um, you know, he was Catholic. He had 11 kids. I just thought he's, he's got to be a really conservative Republican. But he never said what he was. He never really commented on any of the political candidates or, or issues. He was always objective, always professional. And so for all I know, he could be a left-wing radical Bolshevik. I, I, I have no clue. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> whatever he believed, I know he believed in his God, and I know he's with him now. God bless you, Stan, and God bless us all who have known you. Thank you. Guys, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Robert. Diana needs to be given a big hand. Diana is our executive director for the LA Press Club, and she really is the one who put this, uh, made this happen as well. Jason, for coming up with the idea for the entire family. Thank you so much for being here, Robert. <laughs>